question for us? And it would be good, right, and salutary that the first thing we do is say, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And I should start our, uh, we already are recording. Well, most excellent. Um, this is our Life Light Guide Gospel of Matthew Bible study for the, I got the wrong date on here, but it's for the 20, it's the, for the 30th already. And we begin, as always, with worship and our, uh, oh, you know what? I have the wrong sheet. How did that happen? Do you guys have one that says 930 on it? Yes. Good. How did that happen? Norma, start us off and I'll go grab a sheet. responsibly read the words of the introit. Be to me a rock of refuge to which I may continually come. You have given the command to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. You have made me see many troubles and calamities, and you will revive me again. From the depths of the earth, you will bring me up again. You will increase my greatness and comfort me again. I will also praise in the heart for your faithfulness, O oh my God. I will sing praises to you with the lyre, O oh Holy One of Israel. My lips will shout for joy when I sing praises to you. My soul also, which you have redeemed. And my tongue will talk of your righteous help all the day long, for they have put to shame and disappointed who sought to do me harm. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Be to me a rock of refuge to which I continually come. You have given the command to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. We turn to that rock and fortress now in prayer. Lord God, how thankful we are that we have you as our rock and our fortress. One to turn to in times of turmoil and calamity. Someone to turn to as people worried over whether they were exposed to COVID-19 here at this worship or other places they may have been to. May you always be that rock of refuge, knowing that you control all things. You control our lives. Give us wisdom to always follow the guidance of health experts. But we know that in, even in this, in times of uncertainty and things that are beyond our control, you have control of all things, including us in our lives. We ask that you would be with our sister Faith who's suffering from an infection. May she find medicine that will alleviate the side effects that she is experiencing and you would give her uh, and restore her to health. Be with our brother Art uh, 
Reverend Art, as he suffers from depression. Lift him up, Lord. Send people, Glenda, myself, into his life that can speak words of comfort and assurance and faith to him. Be with Chris, who has a lump on her lung. May she receive a correct diagnosis from the doctor so they can move forward and, and address the health issues in her life. <coughs> and Lord, we know that you will be behind that healing according to your good and gracious will. And may the result be she gives you glory and she turns in faith to Jesus as her savior. We give thanks, Lord, for the cousins of Al's family who are recovering from COVID-19. You once again show how you answer prayer in just a miraculous and strong way. Continue to do that in their lives that they may be restored to health. And we pray the same thing for Arthur Walter. We give thanksgiving for the healing that has happened in his life and ask that it would continue. Be a source of strength and assurance, be a rock in her family's life for Nancy and Katie and all the rest of the family that worry and stress over him. But thank you for protecting them from COVID continue to heal and, and be with the doctors and nurses that assist Art, that they would remain free from COVID-19. Lord, be with our country. Grant wisdom and guidance to our leaders, be they national, state, and local. Move both sides of the spectrum to quit fighting and bickering like little kids and do the job of leading this country, to act like leaders and be like leaders. Give us wisdom when it comes time in November. We certainly will need it, Lord. Protect the hunters who are getting ready to go out this season, that they might enjoy time and your creation and be safe from all harm. Be with us now, Lord, as we prepare to turn to you and study your word, and as we pray the collect of the day. Oh God, you have prepared for those who love you such good things as surpass our understanding. Cast out all sins and evil desires from us and pour into our hearts your Holy Spirit to guide us into all blessedness. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Amen. All right. We left off uh, two weeks ago in day two. And day two uh, had a reading of Matthew 13 which is kind of sandwiched in between uh, the two readings from day one, which was uh, the, uh, the parable, help me out here. Wasn't the parable of the sower, huh? Was it the sower? Yeah. So that's what, ha that's what happens when you work ahead, I get mixed up. Um, yeah, so, so Jesus gives the parable, and then there's a break where he talks to the disciples about why he preaches in parables. And then he comes back and gives the explanation. And so we read the parable and the explanation, and we started into day two, which is his little speech in between. I think since there's been so much time, we're going to go back and we're going to start at the beginning of chapter 13, and we'll go all the way through to 23. And then uh, when we get to the questions, we'll kind of return right to where we left off, which was day two, question five. Does that make sense? Sure. Okay. Um, we're going to try to watch the video first. Uh, I'm going about the video in a different way, and uh, maybe it'll play nice. We'll see. Uh, she had a question. That same day. Yes. I'm sorry. You throw things at me or something I'm because lost. I. Where are we? We're at Lamb of God Lutheran Church. Study nine. <laughs> we're, we're on day nine, day, uh, study nine. Day two. And we're, we're going to actually pick it up day two, question five. Oh, yeah, but we're going to actually, we're going to read the scripture surrounding that too. All right. I'm sorry, Karen. I, I'm, I'm really done. So I'm a man. I don't know those things. I don't, I don't give up. <laughs> okay, here we go. Hey, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places, where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly, because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, 
which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. The disciples came to him and asked, Why do you speak to the people in parables? He replied, Because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. For truly I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop, yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Jesus told them another parable. Oh, the kingdom of... He certainly did. And we'll get to that. Okay, let's turn to our Bibles. And uh, I'm going to have you read just 10 through 17, but let me recap a little bit about the, what we studied last time, which was... Uh, uh, this, this parable of the sower. And one of the things we learned was this farmer in Jesus' story, uh, what's amazing about how he's, what he's doing with his seed? Keeps on going with it. Keeps on going with it? Well, how, how, would a, how does a farmer normally, where does he plant seed at? And how careful is he at planting? Usually well, he's just going to plant over what he's tilled up. He, the ground that he's prepared, he's very careful about it, right? In fact, depending on the crop, you make sure that you don't plant seed too close to each other because that would be detrimental. So very, very careful. And also seed costs money, right? So you want to be careful with it because we, if you plant it where it doesn't grow, you're wasting your money. How, does, how is this farmer in Jesus' parable different? He doesn't care. Extravagant, isn't he? Extravagant. And so the seed in Jesus' parable is what? Word. The word. The word, the gospel. And so Jesus is saying to us, how should we be about sharing the gospel? Generous. Can we be too generous? No. No. And so then he goes on to say, okay, well, if you're generous with the gospel, how are people going to react? Not all the same. Not all the same. And why is that? Is it because in some places the gospel doesn't have the power to change hearts and minds? Is it a got problem with the gospel? No. no. Where's the problem? With the persistent heart. 
with a person in their heart. Yeah. And Jesus gives us three different kinds of soils, and they're interesting, and we can understand how those of those are. There's trouble within the world that keeps us from focusing on the gospel. There's the draw of the world, our love for the world. There's problems within ourselves. There's our tendency to go with what we know when we're in trouble instead of turning to Christ. There's always the problem of putting your hope, trust, and faith in what you can't see, touch, taste, or hear. But really, there's only two kinds of hearts, and what are they? Sinful and unrepentant. Repentant and unrepentant. A heart that's been, and a repentant heart is the ground that's been broken, and the soil's a good place to grow. And, it's, and who makes a heart or a soil broken and ready to grow? Who does that? Do I do that? Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does it. Can I work against the Holy Spirit? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And that's the other uh, thing we learned from, from, from this. God's word, even though it's from him and has his power, people can stand against it. And that's why this extravagant spreading of the gospel will not bring an extravagant coming to faith in people. Many can and will stand against it. Questions, comments? Now let's get to this little interlude between the telling of the uh, parable and Jesus explaining it, and that's Matthew 13, 10 to 7. Somebody want to read that? Then the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered them, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, You will indeed hear, but never understand, and you will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's hearts has grown dull, and with the ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they can put, they have closed, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart, and turn, and I will heal them. Okay, this comes right after the original giving of the parable without the explanation. And so the focus of the scene shifts. Jesus is no longer talking to the public. He's just talking to the disciples. And they come and they want to know, why are you teaching in a different way now, Jesus? Why are you teaching in this way? And so he explains to them the reason, and then he'll give them the key to the parable. And one of the key things he says here is, um, for the one who has, more will be given. For the one who has what? More has the faith. Yeah. Faith, the Holy Spirit. The one who has the Holy Spirit, who's created faith. If you have that, you get everything. You get life now and eternal life to come, right? Everything that God has to offer you. The inheritance of Christ, the inheritance of God. And so he who doesn't have, even what he does have, he's going to lose. If you don't have, what is Jesus saying? You don't have what? The Holy Spirit? Faith? If you don't have that, you could be Einstein, right? You could be the wisest person in the world, yet what's going to happen to you? You lose it all. You lose everything in this world and you lose everything for eternity. And that just goes, not just knowledge, but that goes earthly wealth and fame and fortune and all that, doesn't it? With that in mind, let's kind of look at this here. We'll go back. Opposition to, this is I'm reading from day two. Opposition to Jesus continues to increase. So from this point on, Jesus moves his ministry out of the synagogues and into the open air. He preached along the seashore in the desert at homes and on roadsides. There Jesus used parables in his teaching with increasing frequency. Jesus' teaching was clarified by the familiar scenes and easy-to-remember illustrations, yet not everyone understood the hidden meanings in Jesus' parables. 
To some, the kingdom was still a baffling puzzle. Their response to the parables delineated further those who accepted or rejected Jesus. And we talked about what does Jesus mean by the secret mystery of the kingdom of heaven? And those are what? Don't be really specific, but what are, what are the mysteries that are being revealed to us through Jesus? All people, Jews and Gentiles. How much do we know about God? He's loving and kind. Do we know everything about God? No. no. We know what He reveals to us. Yeah. He lets us know about Him. There's far more about God than we know or ever know. Don't ever think that you can, which is why we always say, if you want to know who Jesus is, Jesus represents God to us. He's God in the flesh. If you want to know who God is, look at what Jesus says and does and don't prejudge it. This is who God is, and he's beyond our understanding. And he doesn't always act in ways that we expect him to. But know that that's who God is. And we can try to understand it, and Jesus used rhetoric, and he uses other things. But when you see Jesus doing something you don't expect, don't wonder if the gospel writers had it wrong, or Jesus was just having a bad day. You need to sit down and rethink what you know and you understand about who Jesus is and therefore who God is. There's many secrets of the kingdom and it talked about how just the gospel itself and you had writers like Isaiah, which were, were, were it quotes, it was quoting Isaiah in this little scripture we read here. He had really didn't have any idea what he was talking about in full. Most of what he was writing was directed at the exiles that were in Babylon the first half of Isaiah is warning them, hey, this is going to happen. And a hundred or so years later, it did. And then the second half of Isaiah is, is preaching comfort to them. There will come a time when you'll get to go home. And he probably had maybe a good handle on that. But all the applications to Jesus and after were a mystery to him. And this is what now is being revealed to these people, because the one Isaiah wrote about who was going to fulfill all these things, here he is in the flesh teaching you. Unlocking mysteries that prophets long before wondered about. And then we have a passage I think we read last week, even the angels didn't understand until Jesus lays it all out. And then to whom will he reveal these secrets to, which is verse 11? Somebody read verse 11. By the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, and not to them. To you, who's you? Uh, believers. You, there's a yeah, in in an application, but you, who is Jesus? If he's pointing, who is he pointing to when he said the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given to you? Disciples. The disciples, the twelve. And why why was he giving them to them? Because. They are the they're the ones that are going to be Yeah, they, they've given it all up, and they're following him. They have the spirit. They have faith. One of them will fall away, but the 11 have faith. And so given to you, the disciples who are my followers, and we now are the same. We're those followers. We're called to be disciples, which are learners of Jesus, and we're also called in a fashion as a church to be apostles, to be message bearers of his message. And it's given to us because we have the Spirit. And through the Spirit, we have understanding. We can understand what Scripture says. Them. So who's they? Non-believers. Non-believers. They can scour the Scriptures. They can read these very Scriptures that we're reading. They can read the whole Bible. Are they going to understand what we're allowed to understand? No. Why? They're smart. They got all kinds of learning, Ron. They can, there's guys that can even read it in the Greek. Because they do not have the Holy Spirit in their heart. He reveals it. He makes it truth for you. Otherwise, the best an unbeliever can do is it's knowledge. I can win on Jeopardy with it if the, if the, uh, <laughs> if the column or whatever the subject is the Bible. But, yeah, it's, the Holy Spirit makes it for you. Truth for you truth you're willing to die for, right? With that, here's where we left off, everybody. You just had that uh, summary recap that you often want to skip over. 
<laughs> in the series. So now we're right there. And let's have a commercial. No, I'm kidding. Come on, laugh, lighten up, people. We are, you just can't see it. You're not paying for this, it's all free. What do you expect? All right. Uh, question five. Why are the disciples able to understand the parables of the kingdom while others cannot? And it says, note the verb in verse 11. Maybe we kind of covered this, but that's okay. Is it to you has been given? Yeah. And John, what kind of verb is that? That is uh, perfect, like passive. Passive, which means it's not a, a, an active verb of something you do. I run, I catch, I snarl. Passive is it's happening to you. It's being done to you. And so I give means I just gave this $100 to Tom to be nice to me. <laughs> it was given means that somebody gave that to me. And so how is that important here when we figure out uh, why, why can the disciples understand and others can't? Because the Holy Spirit has not given it to the people who don't understand. The understanding has passively been given. They did nothing to receive it. It was given to them. And it comes through the Spirit who they did not reject. They received the Spirit passively. They didn't do anything to ask for it. The Spirit came to them. Are there people that actively reject the Spirit? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So why is it that uh, others cannot? What have they done? Close their ears to the Holy Spirit. Yeah. They've closed their ears. It's not a matter of the Spirit said, well, I like Ron, so I'm going to turn Ron on to all this knowledge. I don't really like Norma, so we're going to leave her in the dark. No. The difference is once again, and it goes back to what was Jesus teaching in the parable of the sower. It goes out to everybody. It's the heart. The heart makes the difference. Right? And it's that mystery that we don't understand. The Holy Spirit breaks the heart and, 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 and makes, the, it makes it a heart that can accept and hold fast to that faith that was given. And then there's some hearts that are allowed to remain stony and hard and will not receive. And we see that difference here. That's why some understand and some don't. Because those that don't understand, it's not that it hasn't been given to them. It's not that the free gift of faith and the gospel and the Holy Spirit hasn't been given. It's they have rejected it. Questions? Well, I think that sometimes people forget this as being an ongoing process where I could literally say, you know, this is a good lesson that we need to teach the people over there that don't know about Jesus. We've got to spread the word to them. And we never look at this about the fact that we regularly, daily need to receive the word and continually to receive it. Like, ah, I had that. But this story now pertains to me going only out to talk to other people. And we don't really talk much about, hey, every time God's word comes to us, it's seed. And again, we can be responsive to that seed based on how the day's going. Heck, we might be rocks today. <laughs> yeah. And, we, and it's not a matter of us throwing, casting the Holy Spirit out. It's just sometimes we... We don't have the mindset of listening to God's word. We're ignoring it. And sometimes that's because there's my own word in my heart that I know counters against it. And I want to follow that. But the spirit working says, no, that's disobedience, Pastor Mark. That's wrong. And moves me to repent. And am I still a saved person? Yes. Yeah. You're right. Uh, um, Al, we all need that. We all need to hear that. Understanding is given by the Holy Spirit, and we need to keep our ears open. And, uh, yeah, there's, there's people here right now that, that with Jesus that don't understand. But after the resurrection and after Pentecost, might they be people that then understand? Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. So this understanding, and, and we want to look at everybody and say, okay, Ron's not a believer. He's a, believe, he's a non-believer that's confirmed for eternity. John's a believer. He's confirmed for eternity. Nothing that we see right now in our vision, in our short vision, is confirmed for eternity. Ron, before he takes his dying breath, can repent and be saved, right? Yes. And in that time, if John is not connected to the word, can he fall away? Yes. yes. Yeah. 
Jesus is the only one that could look and say, this person will be there with me in eternal life, and this person won't be. We can't. But those that we suspect are not believers who have rejected the word while they're still sucking breath, <laughs> there's time. And they're worthy of our prayer. Is that kind of where you were going to, Al? Or? Yep. Yeah. Good. Excellent. Other comments or questions? We've kind of covered this before, but it's worthwhile to go it again. So we're on the next page, question six. Why don't the others understand? Note especially verse 15. And then we've got some scripture to look up. So while I'm getting that ready, somebody read verse 15. For this person's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their e eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I will heal them. So why don't others understand? Heart becomes callous against God. The verbs in there, are they active or passive? They're also passive. That's which verse? Verse 15. 15? Yeah. These people's hearts has grown dull and their eyes have closed. I think those aren't passive verbs. I think those are active. They should see with their eyes and hear with their ears. Those are definitely active, right? That's what they're doing. Yeah. They see and they hear and they refuse to. They do not. And understand with their hearts and turn and I would heal them. Heart has grown dull. I have to look and see what it is in the Greek. Why would a heart grow dull? Perhaps because you made it dull. How, how, what is the natural condition of our hearts before the Holy Spirit comes? Sinful. Oh. Dull. Dull. Yeah. Dull and sinful, yeah. That's, that's the natural thing that it, uh, that it turns to, isn't it? Let's, we're asked to look at Matthew 23, 37. So let's look at that real quick on the screen. I'll make it a little bit bigger for us. Somebody want to read that? Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as the hen gathers her brood under her wings, and will you not? And will, you would not. This is Jesus standing before Jerusalem. It's pretty close to uh, Palm Sunday in the time of the Passion. And what does he say about Jerusalem? What is his desire? Gather the little children together as a hen gathers a brood under her wings. A very touching, isn't it? A very loving picture. They're like lost little hens that don't know better. And he would love to gather them under his wings. And why can't he? They would not. Why are some saved and others aren't? The ones that are not saved would not. They refuse. Not a problem with the gospel. Not a problem of God being particularly oblique or not understanding or hiding anything from anybody. It's their active refusal. It's their act of turning away. Verse 15, we have uh, hearts growing callous, stuffed up ears, and closed eyes. Uh, God, the Spirit, and His Word are there, ready to apply faith to them, but they refuse Him and His work and His revelation of faith. And, I, and once again, as Al said, sometimes that refusal is for a time, sometimes it's for eternity. But we just keep presenting the gospel anyway, even to those that actively stand against it, because the Holy Spirit works in his own way in his own time. Uh, I also want us to look at Isaiah 6, 8 through 12. 
Um, this is um, this is where part of the scripture that this passage from Isaiah in Matthew is drawn from. And, and this is Isaiah after he's had his appearance before God. He had the miraculous vision of God on the throne and there's smoke filling the uh, the temple where he's at and voices booming and there's mighty cherubim and he's his reaction upon seeing God is I'm a man of sinful lips I'm not a man of sinful unclean people and God directs the angel to take a burning coal off his off the fire and put it on his tongue and say here your sins have been forgiven your mouth is now clean you can be my prophet so God's calling him to be a prophet and uh so after that vision, we pick it up here with verse 8, if somebody wants to read that. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go with us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. So who's going to go? Isaiah said, I am. I'll go. Filled with the Holy Spirit, he's going to go. And then God lays out to him, Okay, this is what it's going to be like when you go. All right, go ahead and finish it there, Al. And he said, Go and say to this to the people. Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy, and blind their eyes, lest they see with their ears and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. Then I said, How long, O Lord? And he said, Until the cities lie waste without inhabitant, and houses without people, and the land is as desolate as a desolate waste. And the Lord removes people far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. So here we have two things happening here. Keep on hearing, but do not understand. They already don't understand. And in God's time and way, the, uh, the time of Jubilee, the, the, the time of grace and mercy does have an end. And that's kind of what's going to happen to these people. And so the word Isaiah is going to preach is going to act not to as the gospel, but it's going to be judgment because they refuse to believe. Here's what you're refusing to believe. And here's why you're going to be taken away to Babylon. And then after Babylon, guess what? You're going to change. You're going to repent. The law is going to smack you down. And that's why it says, until cities lie in waste without habitation, houses without people, the land is desolate. The people in Babylon looked back and said, what have we done? Oh my God, what have we done? But in the mystery of God, we don't know when the time of grace and mercy is over, so we just keep preaching the gospel. We preach the law and we preach the gospel. These people had already turned God off and he kind of confirmed them in their own wickedness. This is going to happen. Babylon's going to come. I warned you, and I warned you, and I warned you, and I warned you. And it wasn't just Isaiah. After that, it was Jeremiah. And he warned them and warned them and warned them. And when it got to the point where Babylon was coming, Jeremiah's message was, hey, just put up with Babylon. God sent them there. Don't rebel against them. Carry the yoke of them. That's your suffering that you had because of your sin. And then turn and trust in me. But they refused. Anyway. Some don't understand that that's a natural condition of our heart. And those that refuse the gospel are sometimes confirmed in that unbelief all the way to the end. Questions or comments? That's rough, isn't it? We don't like to hear that about God, but that's who God is. And he gives ample opportunity for people to come to faith over and over and over and over again. But the truth is, there comes a time when the time of grace is done. It happens in people's lives now, and it'll definitely happen on the last day. When Jesus returns, the time for grace and understanding is done. People will get an understanding, wow, Jesus really was who he said he was. He's the king, but you know what? It's too late to turn in repentance at that point. You're confirmed in your unbelief, and you're headed to eternal hell. Now's the time to believe. Now's the time to preach the gospel. That's who God is. Jesus is not a hippie pacifist. He's the Lord. And he will do what he's going to do. And we need to take him serious on his words of grace and mercy, but also on his words of judgment. 
Question seven, for your personal reflection, sharing optional, how do you respond to a God who has revealed Jesus to you as your personal savior? Thinking also about those that refuse to believe, how does that make you feel that you have this knowledge that you have today? It make us feel sad that we didn't try the harder to but Ron, for you, you personally, as someone that knows Jesus as your Savior, that he died for you, Ron, and he took your sins, Ron, away, and that you have this faith when others don't, how does that make you feel about yourself? Great, because I am confident. It's an awesome gift, isn't it? Thanksgiving. Th especially blessed knowing that just like those people that are lost, that was our heart when we were born. We were born with cold and callous hearts that wanted nothing to do with Jesus, nothing to do with God, only wanted to obey our own personal desires. And it's different for each one of you when you came to faith and how you came to faith. But no, when you were born, that's where you were. We all were at one point. Even David says, I was born sinful. Conceived sinful, born from my mother's womb sinful. I think along with thankfulness, also humility. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Humble because we did nothing to deserve it, did we? In fact, in my case, over and over again, did things that made me very undeserving. Tom. Oh, I just. I are you? Yeah. Are you? Are you having a? Uh, what is that disease where you can't stop moving? <laughs> Say again. What's that disease where you can't stop moving? Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Anyone else? It's, it, there, there's, there's the thankfulness, there's the humility, but then there's also in me, it makes me have the desire to keep, do my part to keep that relationship strong. Because in each one of our lives, do we have a tendency to wander away from that relationship? If we keep trying to wander away, does God have to come get us? No. Especially if we give up our faith. He presented it to you, and you had it, and you, you, you knew, you know, and you believe in, 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 in the wonderfulness of salvation, forgiveness of sins, and eternal life, and then you decide for whatever reason that that's no longer important, that the world is more important, and you give it up and walk it away. Does he, is he beholding to call you back again? No. No. And, and for me personally, he did. I didn't deserve it. And I am so thankful that he did. Because if it wasn't for him, I would still be lost out there. If I had any interaction at all, I'd be making fun of y'all. And I'd be headed to eternal damnation. And I'm so, I'm so thankful that he did. I didn't, once again, didn't deserve it. But he lovingly did it to me. Kept after me for years because I was his baptized child, shoved my face against, against the wall of the law, and then turned and I fell into his arms. It was a wonderful, awesome thing. Grateful. And, and, and in that case, I understand what an awesome gift salvation, eternal life and faith is. It's an awesome gift. And I don't ever want to be there again where I give it up. Any other final comments or questions? If not, why don't we try to get that next parable that Jesus is going to tell? It's going to be once again uh, split, Matthew 13, 24 to 30, and 36 to 43. So he's going to tell a parable. There'll be a break. Actually, I think there's a break for a couple of their parables. And then he gives the, uh, the, uh, the explanation. And we're just going to watch the whole thing all the way through, I think would be the easiest. All right. Let's see if this will work. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, 
Then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds come and perch in its branches. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. So was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, the one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Okay. Norma's uh, said that there, I would probably say something that would make her extremely angry, so that's why she's leaving. No, she has an appointment to go to. Jesus starts off and says, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to, or in another way to say it, may be illustrated like this. So what is the reason for giving this parable? It is a illustration. Yeah, it, it's, it's to describe something that's beyond our understanding with something that we can understand with a daily life event that is kind of similar, not in every single way, but it's similar. And it's important here, may be compared to, this is present tense. In other words, the kingdom of heaven is here now. And this is what it's like right now it's what it was like right now then for jesus is it what it's like right now for us too yeah. Yeah. yes you better believe it and as i read through this parable it is it is really important for us right now with everything that's going on in the world um and the kingdom of heaven is what back then put yourself in the place of uh people in palestine what is a kingdom to them? Well, the earthly kingdom of uh, 
You mean the thing about Palestine? Yeah. Jesus if you're a person of Palestine and I talk to you about a kingdom, what yeah. comes to your mind? They thought of their, their kingdom there, the life with the Romans in control of them. I don't think they saw a heavenly kingdom. I no. They internalized it to their it, it, daily I, life. They did, but I think they saw it also as, as a parable or as a way of understanding oh. heaven. But yeah, kingdom to you is, there's always a kingdom. You're always under some kind of king or sometimes a reign and rule. We are too. It's not like back then though. You had one man that was in power and they made decisions and he ruled. And the place he ruled was the delineation of his kingdom. Uh, in David's time, it was most of the Holy Land. He ruled, that was his place of rule and he was the authority. So the kingdom of heaven is where God, or especially since Christ is bringing it, it's where his authority is present, where he brings his reign and rule. And that starts, is it an outward thing? Did Jesus set up a town and position soldiers outside that town and set up a throne? No. So his kingdom came mm -hmm. where and how? Was it a physical kingdom? No. It was a spiritual kingdom. And he reigns and rules in people's heart. He does reign and rule everything, but in a hidden way. But in a more direct way, he brought his reign and rule into the hearts, souls, and minds of men. Yes? And that, to be sidetracked, but this, this makes me think of uh, when Luther explains the Lord's Prayer, and he gets to the point, thy kingdom come, and then Luther, and I forget that part, guys, because I'm old. Uh, the kingdom of God, what does he say? The kingdom of God comes to us. Whether we ask it for it or not. Okay. We ask, may it come to me. Yeah, my praying the Lord's Prayer doesn't make God's kingdom come. It's already coming. I ask that it would come unto me and remain in me, that his reign and rule would be the truth of my life. Yeah, good. You get a star for remembering Luther, taking us back to the I'm catechism. What he all said, That's okay. You you started down that about path. The same kingdom, the kingdom of God, comes to us today too. Yes. Okay. Now, every time we hear the gospel, it comes and is renewed in us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and what he's telling us in these kingdom parables is the kingdom of heaven, the reign and rule, Christ's activity on this earth doesn't always look like we expect it to. If he really is reigning and ruling, do we expect to see cities burning and people looting and killing each other and two supposed leaders of the country acting like spoiled little brats on national TV? People that one of those God is going to put in place to run our country, do we expect that? No. We don't. When we look back at the Old Testament, What's that? When we look at some of the things that have happened biblically, we shouldn't be all that surprised. No. Sinful man is sinful man. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. But that's what this that's one of the things this, this parable is going to teach us is that God is reigning and ruling, but your idea of what that means is not the same of what of his reality. But but there's a great message at the end for us. Um evil. Evil is allowed to flourish. And Christ knows it. He lets it happen and he uses it. It's not like the devil sneaks in and he has to react and go, oh, wow, didn't see that coming. No. Knew it from the beginning. Even before it happened, he knew it. And it's all part of his plan. He lets it happen to a point. He lets it happen. But, you know, you always want to be careful um, when you talk about permissive and non-permissive will. Um, all things happen for God's plan and purpose. And we can get to the point where we really want to speak for God and make him a nicer guy and say, well, he didn't really put that person in place, but he allowed it to happen. If they're in power, they're there because of him. For however, reasons we don't understand. However, against our wisdom, it's just like what Joseph said, that we might need it for evil, God meant it for good. Excellent! Yes! Yeah. So what even the worst most evil ruler meant for evil, God already before it happened meant it for good. It just doesn't look like we expect it to. And note the other contrast. You have somebody sowing the good seed, and who's that? Jesus said it's the Son of Man, sows the good seed. And what does the devil sow? Wheat. The exact opposite. 
right? He sows lawlessness and encourages people in it. The lawlessness is already in our heart. He sows seeds that encourage that and promotes that in the world. So why is there unrest? Why are there cities burning? Why are there people killing each other? The enemy has done it. He's doing it. And he has people thinking that that's the answer. There's more of that. <coughs> His point here is to encourage the church through these times that we're going through right now. That he is reigning and ruling, even though we can look and say, boy, it sure doesn't look like it. And that's because we go back to Isaiah. My ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. But I have a plan, and nobody stopped it. It's still rolling along. One more thing I want to look at before we turn to the, uh, the uh, oh, no, in the, and the other master thing here is he has a plan. It's his master plan. And in the end, all will be set right. There will be a time when justice prevails and injustice is punished. Verse 41, he says, he will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin. And it's interesting, sin kind of works, but literally what Jesus is talking about is not just sin, but he's talking about entrapment. It's a word for, we get our word that's called scandal. And, and in Greek, it meant it was the bait that would set in a trap. And especially think you have one of those false floors and there's a pit underneath and you hang down from a, a string, this piece of meat, and it's gonna make the animal go over top of that false flooring and fall down and be trapped. And the meat was the bait. And so one of the things that that verb talks about is people that cause other people to sin. All causes of entrapment, in other words, all causes of people falling away. How the devil works through men to actively make people fall away, to draw them away, to turn their attention from Jesus to anything else. Jesus plus whatever. Or not Jesus, but Allah, Muhammad, Shirley MacLaine, the force, your cat, your dog, your life, your vocation. Take your pick. Or maybe how about nothing? Whatever that is. And then there's, then there's lawlessness, which is uh, lawbreakers. Those who refuse to recognize God's reign and rule and actively work against it. And maybe they do that by saying, this is the law. I'm going to tell you what the law is. I'm going to tell you what God really means by this. Or saying that there is no God and there is no law at all. Or even this. Christ died and gave me a free pass. I don't need to worry about the law. All sins forgiven, I can do what I want. Lump all those together. That's what Jesus is talking about. He'll gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawlessness. And there you go. With that, let's turn to our study guide. Comments or questions? Under day three, Jesus continues to teach in parables. He leads us to a deeper understanding of the kingdom of heaven. In the parables of the sower, Jesus shows us how the kingdom comes through the word, which produces a good crop and good soil by God's grace. In the parable of the weeds and the wheat, excuse me, Jesus teaches us about the other sower, Satan, whose evil crop will be destroyed in God's own time. And we're asked to look at verses uh, 24 to 26. Somebody want to read those again? Matthew 13, verses 24 to 26. He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds also, the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, an enemy has done this. So the servant said to him, then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, no, less than gathering the weeds, you root up the wheat among them. Okay, let's stop there. 
the weeds mentioned. Does anybody remember, it's here on your study guide, but anybody remember, remember a guy preaching on this and he told you what the weeds really are? I mean, you gotta wonder, why, why don't the farmers recognize the, the servants? Why don't they recognize right away when, you know, weed and wheat certainly should look different, shouldn't it? And, and this is where especially uh, making me learn another language helps. Weed is a special kind of weed that they're talking about and it mentions it here in this, uh, in question eight. Bearded darnel, closely related to bearded wheat, a poisonous rye grass. In the early stages of growth, even the wisest farmer can't distinguish it from wheat. So what does it look like? Wheat. Looks like wheat. When it comes up out of the ground, it looks just like the wheat. And as it grows, it looks just like wheat. the wheat. So the question is, when is the difference obvious? Harvest. Harvest. Why? Why is it obvious at the harvest time? Because wheat turn, has a head and turn. Can't bear the fruit. Wheat has a head, right, Ron? Right. And the wheat doesn't. The weeds don't. And so the wheat has fruit and the weeds don't. And when we talk and we put that, we know that this is a, a symbolic for men. What does it mean that men are, are wheat that has fruit? What does that mean? Yes, they are. But what is the fruit? Eternal life. Works. The fruit of the Spirit, which is? Love Come on, you good catechism people. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. Yeah. Do unbelievers have that? Oh. No. They might look like it. But they really don't. And I think we'll get to that. Uh, 9A, read verses 27 to 30, which Tom kind of went over. That's, uh, that's no problem. Uh, the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servant said to him, Then do you want us to gather them? But he said, No, lest than gathering the weeds, you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the harvest time, I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them into bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. How do the servants propose to solve the farmer's problem here? Stay within the parable before we extrapolate it. They just want to root up all the, they want to pull out all the weeds. Yeah, makes sense, doesn't it? Wouldn't you guys, if you had a garden, don't you want to pull the weeds up? Because what do the weeds do? Valuable nutrients from the soil that, or block the sun, block the growth. Yeah, it makes sense. In, in any other situation, that would be the natural thing that a farmer would do. Yeah, get them damn weeds out of there. Um, what does that tell us about uh, how me, we might want to react? If, we if, might also react the same way when we see sin and evil in the world. Lord, why don't you stop these idiots from burning down cities and from shooting police officers and from doing any number of evil things that are going on? Lord, why don't you stop it? Are we like those farmhands? Yes. Yeah. And, and in saying that, are we kind of bordering on questioning what God is allowing? God, are you really doing your job? Let me give you a little advice here on what should happen. You really should be doing this, right? <laughs> you may not be doing that up front, but aren't we kind of bordering on that? Look, I have a better plan. Yeah, let me, let me just clue you, give you a little advice here. Kind of like Peter, Jesus, when you go to Jerusalem, you're not supposed to die, let me tell you what you're supposed to do. It's not that, yeah. And how did Jesus respond to Peter? Get behind <laughs> me, Satan, yeah. <laughs> Whenever I think I might have a better idea of what God should do, I remember the get behind me Satan thing. And I, before I'm called Satan, obediently turn back and follow him instead of trying to lead in front of him. B, what reason does the farmer give for his solution? Note the motivation for his solution. So what is what reason does the farmer give for not doing that, not pulling the weeds up? Well, at that point you can't. They know they're weeds now because they're not they're not sprouting. Yeah, so they, they can see it. But even so, isn't that surprising? Yeah, it's 
says wait till the harvest. Yeah. yeah. And what is his reason for waiting? No, less than gathering the weeds, you root up the wheat along with them. Where's the concern? Is 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 the concern for the weeds? No, it's for the wheat. For the wheat. For the... Evil's allowed to remain there out of concern for us in ways that we may not be able to understand. Keep this in mind too. Um, who's, who's actually going to take care of things uh, when the time comes? Who's, who's going to actually uproot the wheat? The Lord of the harvest. His angels, the harvesters. He said, I'll send the harvesters out. So he's not saying this to the farmhands. And the farmhands are more like us, especially pastors, but also leaders of the church and even individual members, right? Can we always correctly judge whose weeds and whose wheat? No. Does everybody all produce fruit at the same time? No. In the same way? The same level? Have you ever come across somebody that you thought wasn't a believer and wasn't a committed Christian and you find out they're doing amazing things you never knew about? They just weren't vocal about it. And, and that ties right in with myself and perhaps others where we become judgmental and say, oh, that person's a weed, uh, kick them out. Uh, <laughs> You know they're bad. I'm good. Get rid of that stuff now. And God said, No, 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 no. You don't. You don't make that call. I make that call. Yeah. We want to play God a lot, don't we? Yeah. We want to get rid of the weeds. And 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 Jesus is going to go on to say in the explanation that the field is the world. And so we're talking about the evil that exists around our church, and across the country and across the world. But he's also talking about what exists within our midst right now. Not everyone that gathers on Sunday morning is a believer. They may look like it, but they're not. And we should not, we should not be surprised if things happen that we don't expect. If people have problems or act in ways we don't expect, know that not everybody in that congregation is a believer. And also the ones that are, they are broken, sinful people who are overcome by their emotions and their fears, just like I am. I don't want to call them weak Christians because we all have our weak moments, don't we? Mm -hmm. And so we're called to be forgiving and understanding. Let God handle the judging. But yeah, that's, that's uh, we, we don't truly know. We can look at fruit. But God looks at whose weeds and whose wheat, not based on right now at this moment. And can we judge anything else? We can judge what's happened in the past, right? And I can judge what people are doing now. Can I judge what's going to happen in the future? Only God knows at the time of the harvest who are going to be the weeds and who are going to be the wheat. Truly. Because he's the one that judges hearts. Comments or questions? You liking this parable? Let's let's finish up the explanation and we'll get more into uh, why it's such a great parable for us today. So let's go to 10. Uh, read verses 36 to 43. Somebody want to do that? Then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came, with, came to him and said, explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered. A little louder, Rob. He answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is, is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. How far? 41? 43. 43. And as the weeds are pulled up and burned into the, in the fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out his kingdom, everything that causes sin, and all who do evil. They will throw them into the fiery furnace, where there, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then 
the righteous will shine like the sun. In the kingdom of their father, who has ears, let him hear. Okay. At, at the time of harvesting, what will happen? They'll gather together the weeds and burn them. And so the weeds are the unbelievers, those who have rejected faith. And what will happen to them? Eternal fire. Yeah, cast into the eternal lake of fire. Let's think about that. Um, you think there'll actually be like a lake and there'll be flames coming up from it? We don't know. But I think Jesus is giving us, once again, he's giving us a word picture of something that's beyond our understanding. Thank God none of us have been there yet. And once you go and do experience that, you won't be able to come back and tell me because I'll be in a different place. <laughs> we don't want to know what that experience is like, but Jesus is giving a warning. And he, he preached sinful hellfire damnation, didn't he? That wasn't his only message, but he sure preached it. And it's something that has to be part of our explanation to people too. There is a, a consequence for unbelief and man, you don't want to ever experience it. So uh, when you think of that, the eternal lake of fire, what would it be like to be thrown alive in your body into a fire? What it would it be like to bur be burned alive? Painful. Beyond our understanding, isn't it? Yeah. And eventually, if I was to throw you in a fire now, you would eventually succumb to it and your suffering would be over. But this is a, what kind of a fire? Eternal. 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 You suffer for And on the last day when Jesus resurrects bodies, he will resurrect our body as believers. They will be made new, perfect, glorious bodies. Unbelievers will have their bodies resurrected too. Why? So they will be thrown into the eternal lake of fire. So their suffering will be emotional, physical, and spiritual. Forever. How does Jesus describe what the situation will be there? Um, well, the gnashing of teeth and yes, it's it's the uh, gnawing and gnashing of teeth. Yeah, and uh, here's here's another way where the knowing the language helps. Really, what's being described here? Weeping, the weeping is bitter grief springing from utter hopelessness. It's a grief that goes beyond people that were crying yesterday because uh, Doris Wamsley died. There's hope there, right? This is a grief and there's no hope. It, it, it's something that we have not experienced yet. I think even in our darkest moments, somebody comes alongside us and gives us hope. Hope in Christ and the resurrection, hope in a better way tomorrow, hope that the Lord will help us find a new normal when we're missing those that have died this there is no hope and it's forever grief that knows no hope how deep is that think about that how deep and how awful mm -hmm. and it's forever gnashing of teeth extreme anguish that is physical emotional and spiritual and there you have the eternal lake of fire. And I know I say it before, I like to repeat things because I'm probably getting dementia, but it's, it's not something you'd want to wish on your worst enemy. Your anger, eventually your enemy is going to subside. This does not end ever, which is a way that helps me to, to say, I even people that I despise and hate, I need to, if I have a chance, Preach the gospel to them and at least forgive them. Not hang out with them and make them my best buddy. But what they will suffer, especially if they're unbelievers, is going to be beyond what I can ever wish on them. When I really think about what's coming. And so the injustice in the world, what is Jesus telling us is going to happen to that injustice and that lawlessness that's surrounding us? What's going to happen? It's going to be gone. Justice will prevail. A justice that's beyond what you could ever dole out. It'll happen. There it is. Your promise. Okay, there's the law. Now let's focus on the gospel. What will happen to the wheat, the sons of the father? This is B. 
What is their end that Jesus tells us? Shining like the sun. Shining like the sun. Why? Why will they be shining like the sun? Going to be heaven, and what are they going to be going to heaven with? How, Ron? How are they going to be with Jesus? Uh, spirit only? No, body. Yeah. What kind of body? Glorified. Like his. Reflecting his light, his glory. Filled with his glory. And a perfect body. Yeah. Glorified. Filled with his glory. Shining like the sun. When the sun's out after a gloomy day like this, how does it make you feel? Multiply that beyond reason or exponentially. And what is it going to be like standing there with Jesus and our new bodies with the new heaven and the new earth spread around us? As far opposite as the eternal lake of fire as you can get, isn't it? Um, oh, we, I, we were supposed to do this. Um, this, this. This is Matthew. We're going to read Matthew 25, 41 to 46. This is in regards to that uh, scripture about the, the weeds being uh, thrown into the fire. Let's read Jesus' description here in Matthew. Somebody want to read that? This is, the, this is his, uh, it's like a parable. It's the great throne of judgment. Jesus says at the end of the days, there'll be a throne set up. All will appear before Jesus. He'll separate, separate the sheep from the goats. Sheep are believers. Goats are unbelievers. And uh, on his left are the goats. And Jesus, pick it up there with 41. What is he going to say to them? Say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for you, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly, I say to you, as you did not do this to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous eternal into Before those weeds are cast into the fire, what does what kind of interaction do they have with Jesus? Well, it's not like a face-to-face -face confrontation. There was actually dialogue there. Well, when what is presented to them? The law. Every reason why they're going into the eternal lake of fire. You had no fruit. But when were we supposed to have fruit, Jesus? When you didn't do to the least of these, you didn't do it to me. So once again, weeds, no fruit. What kind of, what is fruit? We do fruit not for ourselves, but for Others. our brothers and sisters in Christ, and not just them, but whoever's in need, whoever our neighbor is, right? Whoever's around us. And so all those things and all those ways that they did not produce fruit, but produce the fruit of unbelief, which is selfishness, all that's laid before them. And so not only do you have the physical, emotional, and spiritual torment of the eternal lake of fire, but you take with you all these ways that you did not serve Jesus because you didn't serve your fellow man. And these will go away into the eternal punishment uh, and uh, Later on here, actually, Jesus talks about the place of eternal punishment uh, actually was only for the angels. It was created for the evil angels and the devil. That's what the eternal lake of fire is for. But men go there because they refuse to believe to a place that was never meant for humans. So let's look at what Jesus says about uh, what will happen to the wheat as they're gathered into the barn. Uh, Read this section of Matthew 25, 34 to 40, if you would. I'll read it. 
Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. You didn't make it, you didn't earn it, it was prepared for you. And who prepared that kingdom for you? Jesus. Jesus, yeah, go to prepare a place for you. Right before he died on the cross and rose again, that was him preparing the place for you. And you now have a place in God's eternal kingdom because he prepared it. And why are you going there? Jesus says, for I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did you, we see you as a stranger or welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when do we see you as sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. So here, eternal life is something that is earned. That's kind of a scary thought, isn't it? But it's really not earned by our actions. Did any of these righteous people have any idea they were doing anything to earn the kingdom of heaven? No. 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 They didn't even realize what they were doing, where they were doing it for Jesus. They just did it. Do you make conscious choices for the fruits of the Spirit? Do you actually sit down and is it all you saying, well, let's see, I need to be faithful, loyal, well, loving, da, da, da. No. The Spirit engenders that in your heart. And it pours out from you. You do have some choices. Well, we're going down to Franklin Mission today. I don't really want to go, but I'll go. And then what happens to you there is not so much a conscious choice. It's the Spirit working in you. There's need. There's people looking to you. And the love and compassion pours out of your heart. It's a mysterious working of you with the Spirit. But my gosh, it's mostly the Spirit. And so you earn eternal life basically on... Jesus, the love that he gives you, and also he makes your works good. If not for him, we could serve at Franklin Mission umpteen million times, and it will always have some kind of a selfish thing in our heart about it. Either I want Tom to see me, that I'm doing such good stuff and I'm down there working, or I feel guilty because I have and these people don't. Those are not fruits of good, of good works. That's all sinful and selfish towards me. I do it even though... It's giving of my time, my talents, a sacrifice of all these things. I do it anyway out of a love that's not centered on me. It's centered on others. And truly, one of the things we receive from Jesus is we receive credit for he who is the only one that really, really did good works. We receive the credit for that. And so in that respect, Jesus earns for us eternal life. But he had to earn it for us. We receive credit for his good works, and his good works make our works good. Make sense? Yes. So eternal life is just is a free gift. Somebody earned it for us, though, and Jesus earned it. Questions or comments? The other important thing that I... Uh, go ahead, Al. I'm sorry. Well, we're out of time, but for another time, I was going to throw out... We talked about hell today. Hell is really an uncomfortable thing to talk about. You don't hear it much in church. Many denominations don't talk much about hell. It makes everybody uncomfortable. And the other, again, for another time, but even that, well, hell is so final, so bad, so separate. What about like white collar crimes? Isn't there a, a, an in between place? Isn't there? It's hard. <laughs> We don't want to talk about the finality of hell. And it's just not in. People don't do it. And you, churches that do talk hell, get made fun of because yeah. it's not. How would you have an in between place? Purgatory, so, John. Purgatory is, is the place is, of white collar crimes. Man has come up, man has come up with, uh, yeah, man has come up with his own way of justifying that. But that, again, another topic, but. Yeah. You know, you made me think about hell today. Yeah. But I mean, oh boy, am I a good Lutheran pastor? I made you think about hell. Okay. No, notice, notice, we talked about hell first, and then we talked about eternal life. Exactly. Yeah. Give it's me credit like, for that, John. Are you with Jesus in eternity, or are you not with Jesus in eternity? Makes a difference. Yeah. Like with him or not with him? Like where's the in between there? 
No. Can you do the He's human in the next room. Human, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, human nature fights that concept. Ah, oh, come on! I can't really. No, no, no. I, in my own mind, I can't. I can't deal with that. I've got to come up with a better place. <laughs> it, it, it's it's eleven thirty-five. Yeah. You can leave if you want. I'd like to have five more minutes, up to ten more minutes of your time. Uh, we can finish eleven, and I think it's important because eleven is going to have us look in Romans, and Romans is really going to help us with the oppression and depression of that uh, judgment we just read. So um, I'm going to go through it really quick, and uh, let's just look at what it has to say. It says the evil, the evil in the world, the evil even in those who call themselves Christians, and the evil within our own hearts may tempt us to despair. In light of Jesus' teaching in this parable, how can you live victoriously today? Uh, and it asks us to read through Romans 8, uh, 15 to 39, and jot down one verse that has particular meaning for you. I'm going to go through them in pieces, and I jot down what I thought. I invite you to turn to it at home and take time and look at it yourself. So Romans 8, 15 through, so I'm going to read 15 through 17. <clears throat> for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. But you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, whom by we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. We're adopted. We're adopted into God's family. And because we are, God is who? Father. Abba. Daddy. Our loving Father. The one who will send the weeds into eternal hell, that's not how we look at him as the eternal judge. He is our loving father. He's given us his spirit, which bears witness with our spirit, who is constantly telling us, no, you're not a weed. You're a precious children of God, baptized and kept into faith by my power. And because we're children, we earn everything. We inherit everything that Christ has given to us, and that's eternal life. But not just eternal life off in the future, presence with him now very real presence with him now, a rock and our refuge with us now. But even so, what's going to happen? We have to suffer. We suffer because Christ suffered. Don't think that this means the Spirit has left you or that all of these things about being his child is wrong. There's going to be suffering now. But what's going to happen in the end because we suffered? We suffered. He works in us to keep our faith, and we will be glorified with him. We will be gathered into him and we will shine like the sun. That will happen in your life. Um, 18 to 23. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed to us. For creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and to obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we await eagerly for the adoption of sons and the redemption of our bodies. And we certainly are groaning right now, aren't we? We groan with the sin without, we groan with the sin within. I get damn tired of committing the same sins over and over again. I really do. I say, Lord, will you take this away from me? And I still have to suffer with it day after day, but it draws me closer to him because no way can I ever think I can live life without him. I need him as my savior every single day. Creation groans without wildfires, hurricanes, storms, even the nastiness that's going on in the city, that's creation groaning because it's been subject to futility by the Lord because of our sin. But yet, what are we awaiting? We're awaiting in ourselves the redemption of us which happens when faith comes, but we're waiting the final day of eternal redemption when all will be set right. That day when evil will be gone and only thing that exists is Jesus and his presence and everything restored to the perfection of creation again. And we groan with pains of childbirth waiting. So the suffering we have now are like childbirth. They're hard, which is something I don't know. You women can tell me that, but what do they mean? It means eventually there's going to be a child, isn't there? There's going to be this joyous thing that is so joyous and so wonderful. We forget all about the pains of childbirth and the joy of holding this baby, this new life that belongs to us. And all of the pain and suffering of, of the, of the uh, um, 
of the pains of childbirth now on that last day will be gone. And so we can look at all the suffering now as a fulfilling a prophecy and knowing that this means that last day is coming. Because these things that are happening that Jesus told us, that last day will come. Uh, I'm going to read 24 and 25. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. That's all about faith, isn't it? We have faith in what we can't see, touch, taste, or feel. And it certainly looks out like there that God's not ruling, and maybe that end won't come. Maybe evil will just keep increasing, 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 and overrun the earth. But by faith, we hold what we can't see, touch, taste, or feel is true. And we hold a hope in what Scripture says, even though it doesn't look like it. And it's easy for me to say that sitting here now, but when evil strikes my life very close, death, COVID-19, then it gets hard, doesn't it? Yet God's truth and God's promises remain. He is with you. And you still are his adopted son, no matter what comes upon you in this world. Uh, 26 and 27. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We aren't left alone to suffer. The Spirit is there to help us in our weakness. Yeah, to take those groanings and lift them up to God, but just to walk with us through that, to be our rock and our fortress and our refuge and our spring, to search our minds and to help us with all of those fears and things we suffer with, to turn those over to God and then hold fast to his promises of faith. We are not alone as we walk through this at all. 28 to 30. For we know that those who love God, all things work together for the good, for those who are called according to his purposes. Know that uh, this is plural. All those who are called according to his purpose. We know that for those who, are, who love God, all things work together. This is not, we know that for Mark, all things work together. Because sometimes things are not actually for my good, but they're for your good. They're for my eternal good, and they're for your eternal good. Sometimes I, not just as a pastor, but a person, might suffer because it's for the good of believers around me and it's for the good of the church. Because maybe in just a little way, I can manifest to you faith during hard times. And then maybe when I fall, manifest to you the forgiveness of Christ as I ask him forgiveness and ask you for forgiveness for the ways that I've let you down during the hard times. For those who before knew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Not by accident that you guys are children of the Father. He sought you. He cleansed you. He reached into the devil's kingdom and pulled you out and gave you faith and keeps you in faith. Not by accident, he knew before you were born that you would be his, and he made it all happen. He continues to make it happen in your life. Even as evil tries to invade and the devil tries to pull you away, God is mightier and he is working and he is on your side. And he cannot be defeated by the devil. What can we say about these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? No one. He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God as elect? The devil can't. It is God who justifies, who can condemn us. Christ is the one who died. More than that, who was raised again, who is at the right hand of God, and who is indeed interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Can tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? For it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are what? more than conquerors through him who loves us. And then finally, for I am sure neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. As evil grows in the world, and it will grow. And as the world turns increasingly dark, and it will. And as Satan continues to grasp hold of all human institutions, and before the end, that will happen. Know that these words stand as truth. 
for me, after studying that, this, these were great and wonderful words. And so I would invite you, they're here on your page, go home and give them some thought next time you do a meditation. Think about those things. Final questions or comments? That's one of my favorite verses. Yeah. It is. One of those. <laughs> Paul was rocking here, wasn't it? He was nailing it. He was in the zone. <laughs> Paul knows a little bit about suffering too, doesn't he? Maybe he's revealing to us what was going on in his heart when he was in that jail in Philippi. And uh, who was it, Silas with him? And this, this is a little bit of a uh, abbreviation, but hey, Paul, feel like singing? Not really, but let's go at it anyway. And so they're in this dark jail chain thinking that they might die. They're singing hymns and it changes the hearts and minds of all those that are in jail with them. And also they get to change, the Holy Spirit works for them to change the heart and mind of the jailer. Amazing stuff. Let's pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we can get scared sometimes when we see what's going on in the world. It overloads us. We can drop into deep despair, yet your words here give us wonderful comfort and hope and assurance. It's not our job to bring justice to bear in this world. That's your job. We do need to pray for our leaders, that they would be just and you would use them to keep justice in the peace. Yet you will do what you're going to do and your will will be done. Help us know if, if peace leaves our area in our life, if trouble and hopelessness comes, help us to turn to your scripture and hold fast to it. Find our hope in your words, which are always true and always right and always in effect. Thank you, Jesus, for making it so no one can accuse us. Thank you for making us right with you. Keep us right with you as we continue to study your word through that word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thanks for your patience, everybody. We will see you next time.